Hey, good morning, everybody. How's it going? All right, good to see you. Come on, ducks lose in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Come on. All right, let's do some repentance. Come on, you know, church is about getting your baggage out on the table and dealing with it, letting God deal with it. How many of you men need to repent of things you said, thought, or did every day? Any ladies, come on, you, you're repenting because of the thoughts you had towards your husband. You're like, why is this grown man crying like a baby about a silly game, men wearing tights playing? You know, I, I, did, I definitely need to repent of some of the attitudes and thoughts and perhaps words that were spoken from my mouth. I don't like to lose, but the beautiful thing is that, hey, you get to come on Sunday and God is here in this place. And, uh, and yeah, maybe, maybe some of you are like, I, I was so brokenhearted, I, I realized my need for God. So I'm not even a church person, but I came to church today. My name's Jake. I'm the lead pastor here at Joy Church, along with my wife, Bethany. We want to welcome you here. And uh, I know you're not here by accident. God brought you here. And I believe everybody here, whether you've been at Joy Church since day one, been a Christian for 30 years, or whether you came last week for the first time, or this is your first time, I believe today you are going to be encouraged and God's going to speak to you in a unique way, speak to you personally, and each of us are going to take another step in our journey with God. So I'm excited to be here with you. And uh, we've been in a series called Us, <clears throat> as we saw up on the screen there, talking about the uniqueness of the church and why the church matters, that we're not just a social club or another institution uh, in society, but we are the ragtag band of misfits, come on, that, that Jesus has called out of the world to form uh, his church and when we are saved and we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we uh, receive Christ and his forgiveness for our sins, he brings us into this community that he has chosen as his vehicle to bring hope and healing into the world. So we're talking about the church and uh, we've been talking about, you know, you had to be there, why it's so important that we are here every Sunday, you know, within reason, obviously we go on vacations and all that. I, I'm going to take a vacation this year. Come on, going to Mexico, somebody. Hello. I didn't get enough amens on that. Shrimp tacos. Come on. Still too discouraged about the ducks. But, uh, but you know, when, when, really when the doors are open, it's our value, it's our heart to be here together worshiping God. This is a unique place. So we've been talking about what it looks like to be the church. And today I want to talk about the area of service, about serving and living a life that leaves an impact. One of our core values here at Joy Church is service, that we are servants just like Jesus, that Jesus taught us a new way to live, not just like the world around us looking to you know, climb the corporate ladder and win the rat race uh, and step on other people to get there. But living a life where we lay our life down in service of others really is the true path of fulfillment. And that's what Jesus taught us. That's what it looks like to be a part of the church. So we're going to talk about that today. But before we do that, I want to just kind of reflect a little bit on the culture that we live in. I think this, and I think you'll probably agree with me, that we live in a selfish, self-centered culture. Now, it's easy to go and look at other people and go, man, they're selfish, they're self-centered, they're, they're not serving. But actually, I want us to kind of turn the mirror and look at ourselves because culture is a reflection of you and I, isn't it? The world we live in, the atmosphere environment we live in is the world of our own creation, uh, our, our society, our culture. So if our culture is, is self-obsessed, if our culture is selfish, I think we have to look and say, man, some of those seeds are planted in my heart too. But I want you to think about the fact that it's the norm that our culture is selfish. In fact, we invented a word in this generation that literally encapsulates it all. It's the selfie. Come on, that you get a phone, you know, even my iPad here has a camera that points at me so I can take pictures of myself, right? Does this picture make my butt look bigger? You know, like, I actually don't have a butt. I'm just back to crack. You know, I was just what I was born with. Right? <laughs> don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. But <clears throat> it's a... It's a genetic deficiency, but uh, we have uh, this thing, the selfie, like we have cameras that point back at us so we can take pictures of ourselves. And you go, I don't do that. I'm, I'm a grown man. Okay, buddy, you were crying last night about a football game. So chill out if you think you're judging other people. But we've invented this, uh, this word. We've invented this thing, the selfie. I want you to think about that we have some of our most popular shows, like The Voice. And we literally have a show called, maybe it's not on anymore, but it was at one point American Idol. The word idol is literally in it. You know what I mean? Like, hey, this is great. American Idol. Like we're worshiping idols. Uh, and you're like, no, that's not what's going on. I know. I know. But you think about this. I remember watching American Idol one time with my family because they like watching karaoke. I don't like it, but <clears throat> they were watching it. 
And, uh, and they're like so into it. And everybody in line, they, they'd interview people. You know what I mean? Have you seen these shows? The people are waiting in line to get their chance to be a big star. And they're interviewing people. And you hear this kind of stuff all through the line. Yeah, I, I've been serving other people. I've been helping other people. I've been giving. But now it's my time. And you think, what a horrible thing to say. Do you have no self-awareness? You, might, you should at least conceal this unbridled passion to be a star. You know what I mean? Like at least pretend a little bit. Uh, but the thing about this is it's just actually we're looking in the mirror because what we're looking at is that each of us tends to put ourselves first. We tend to fight for our place in line. Come on, I have little kids and I'm just gonna tell you right now, children are not born perfect and good and then their environment turns them into selfish little uh, monsters. No, they start that way. Mine, you know what I mean? They, they're always fighting and clawing for their place. Like, no, me first, right? My kids, and I'm like, guys, be like Jesus. They're like, dad, we've learned everything we know from you. <laughs> Touche. But we, we kind of have this root, this, this heart of being selfish by nature. And so the thing is, though, if we want to make a difference, we need to be different. If we, as the church, as the followers of Jesus, called out of, of the world, want to make a difference and actually see the world around us change and begin to look more like what God would want it to look like, we have to make a decision. I'm going to be different than what my natural inclination leads me towards. I think we have this myth or this lie that is per pervasive throughout culture right now, which says if something is natural, if you were born that way, whatever that means, whatever you have a natural desire to, that means that it's good and it's authentic as long as it's a natural desire. The problem with that is a lot of us have natural desires that cannot be righteously fulfilled. So I might desire to steal your hamburger and shove it into my mouth, but that's not okay, right? It's called stealing and gluttony. It's two sins in one. It's a special, right? Bonus. Um, my, my, my inclination might be to rip off whatever awesome Nikes Landon happens to be wearing that particular day and place them upon my feet. Ah, oh, cool. Flips, <laughs> flip flops. That's awesome. Uh, so not today, but you know, other days, other days, but that, that isn't okay. And we go, Hey, that's not right. So just because something is natural or just because something you were, you, you started off with this inclination towards that doesn't mean we just go that direction. Come on. Are you with me? So if I want to make a difference, I've got to be different. I have to say, actually, Jesus, you've got to take lordship of my life and help me to subordinate that, which is not how you'd ask me to live, what you'd want me to live, and actually find true fulfillment in becoming the person you've actually designed me to be. But, right, I have to, if I want to make a difference, I got to be different. So how many of you remember calling shotgun? You remember doing this? How many of you still do this, right? If you're like married and you're married couple, shotgun, don't do that, okay? Just give your wife the front seat, get in the back, dudes. But uh, when I was a kid, my sister and I, we were always in this titanic struggle uh, this warfare between firstborn and secondborn, and she was always striving to take my rightful God-given position at, in shotgun. And I'm like, forget that, right? But how many of you know shotgun, this is like inviolate, uh, uh, you can't break this law. Uh, like basically, if you call it, how many of you know? Shotgun, and then somebody gets in the front seat, you're gonna fight to the death. There will be a shotgun because that you're breaking a cosmic law of the universe. Come on, am I right? So shotgun is where, you know, you want to ride in the front seat with mom or dad or whatever. And that's kind of like the Garden of Eden in the car because the back seat's nasty. There's like McDonald's French fries coming up out of the seat. You know, it smells weird. It smells like your little brother because your little brother's in the back seat. My brother could simultaneously smell like excrement and candy. And I don't understand. It's like you smell weird. And I didn't want to sit in the back seat. Okay. Some of us parents, we've forgotten what it's like back there. Just three feet behind where you're sitting is like a horrible place. Because we go back there sometimes, you know, when somebody rides in our car and I'm like, what is going on back here? It's anarchy. It's horrible. There's like new creatures. Actually, evolution is true because they're growing. They're becoming alive back there. And that, that was like, that was where you didn't want to be. So when you get, when there was an opportunity to get into the front seat, you call shotgun and you try to get out of that zone. And uh, this happened actually to Jesus with his disciples. So some of Jesus' disciples were trying to call shotgun. They're trying to improve their position. We see this take place in Mark chapter 10. Jesus, uh, uh, bless his heart, he was leading these, these 12 guys that were a mess. Now, actually, scholars have, have let us know, uh, John and James, who are the two guys we're going to see featured here, the sons of Zebedee, are probably between 14 and 18 years old. So Jesus wasn't like, Jesus was a youth pastor. Come on. Jesus had to watch teenagers, which is not fun. Can I get an amen, Kyle and Kayla? Sometimes it's, it's good, sometimes not so much. 
So here's James and John, and it says in verse 35 of Mark 10, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. And he said, what is your request? They replied, well, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. In other words, we call shotgun. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? And what Jesus is saying in plain modern English is, I'm gonna, about ready to get ran over by the pain train. And you guys don't understand what is coming uh, my direction. They said, oh yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, well, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. In other words, calling shotgun, going with your natural inclination is not going to cut it here, guys. And I'm not going to give you what you want. It's not up to me. God's determined these things. And it says in verse 41, when the when the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. I love the word indignant. It's a tiny little word that has so much meaning and power and potency. Last night, as the Auburn Tigers threw a pass with nine seconds left and won the game, I was there and I was indignant. I'll let you fill in the blanks. Indignant. <laughs> So Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be, what does it say? Different. Come on, if I wanna make a difference, I need to be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. <laughs> Hold on a second. What? What do you mean? Like I called shotgun. You can't break the rules, Jesus. He says, no, no, no. We don't do things like that around here. Come on, culture, as Dr. Sam Chan says, is the way we do things around here. And we have a problem as Americans is that we have a culture, but Jesus also has a culture and they don't mix. And see, Jesus is telling his guys, look, the way we do things around here is different. Why? Because we're not trying to reproduce the same results that we've had. We're trying to do something different in the world. And so he says this, you got to be a servant. You got to be a slave. For even the son of man came not to be served. He's talking about himself, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is saying, guys, we're doing things different. The kingdom culture where, where God's will is done, where God rules and reigns, this culture is different than the culture of this world. And therefore it produces different results, different fruit. So here's the thing. If we want to change the world, if we want to actually see this world around us, which is a very broken place, a very selfish place, if we want to see it change and look more like God's kingdom, right? If we want to see heaven come to earth, we've got to change the way that we operate. We can't operate like the world and change the world. We have to be different. And to live a life that leaves an impact requires us to take on the mantle, take on the, 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 the robe of a servant, right? To say, I'm going to actually lay down my rights even when I'm right, and I'm gonna serve other people. I'm gonna serve in the church, and I'm gonna serve as the church in the world. I'm gonna serve others like I serve Jesus, and I'm gonna bring change by operating in a different mindset. Come on, are you with me? And so as part of the church, part of our role as followers of Jesus is that we are not permitted to simply be spectators uh, in the crowd, but to be, we are called to be participators in service, which means we're called to get off the bench and get on the field and do something. Come on, we're called to get out of, of our comfort zone from time to time or all the time and step into serving other people, not lording it over other people, not getting a position of authority and being like, now I can rest, now I can boss all these people around, but leading others from a place of service. This is what Jesus does. So I want to give us four handlebars on this, four handholds on this message today of how we can leave kind of the natural mindset of serving ourselves and move into serving Jesus, okay? And move into serving others. So number one, we need to do this. We need to be like Jesus and put others first, okay? How many of you know when somebody's like, hey, just be more like Jesus? That's kind of, well, that's a little tough because, you know, he's Jesus, right? But actually, this is our standard. One of the things I love about the Christian faith is that it's simultaneously uh, possible and impossible. And here's what I mean by this. It is absolutely, utterly out of our grasp and out of our uh, capacity and ability to be like Jesus 
if it's just up to us in our natural state. Come on. But, come on, say but. It's a big but, but, right? But God came and gave us Christ, offered us Jesus, and through his death and resurrection, we can become participators in his life. Come on. Through the death of Jesus, we can become participators in his grace and his goodness, and he can give us the power and the strength to actually be like Jesus, okay? So we need to be like Jesus and put others first. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, uh, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Philippi. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Now, I want you to think about Jesus. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and, and there's this discussion. This is obviously a dramatization of events that I have absolutely no uh, insight into. But they're sitting there, God, and, and and, and said, so I'm going to send you to earth. And Jesus has every right to stay where he is and say, now they made that mess. They made their bed. Let them lie in it. But that's not what he does. He, he empties himself. Theologically, this is known as the kenosis. In Greek, it means the emptying. That somehow in this mysterious way, God becomes a man. He enters into our story and he invades our mess and he lays his life down for us. This is what Jesus did. And that level of, turn, uh, that level of service really turned the world upside down. I want you to think about the fact that 2,000 years ago, when Jesus entered our story, it changed everything from that point to today. The very reason that we're standing here preaching and worshiping and talking about Jesus and trying to live our lives like him is because of the impact of his servanthood. Not the impact of necessarily his leadership or the impact of this great big ministry that he built. No, it was the impact of his emptying of himself, of laying his life down. So the first act of a Christian is always to pursue to be like Jesus. Come on. Not to be like Jake. Please, God, no, right? Not to be like John. Not to be like Jake. Oh, there's another Jake. Jake's Unite. That's awesome. Just picking people out. You know, not to be like each other, but to be like Jesus, which is why comparison never works. Oh, I'm a little bit better than that person. Yeah, but you're a lot worse than this person. So how you feel now? No, we're all striving to be more like Jesus. And that kind of a lifestyle, the, the greater the position that you have that you lay down to serve others, the more impact that you make. So that's, a, that's number one, be like Jesus. Number two, within the church, we need to make the move, and this is a difficult move, okay? But we need to make the move from spiritual consumer to spiritual contributor. Make the move from spiritual consumer to spiritual contributor contributor. We need to recognize that the church does not exist for us. We are the church and we exist for the world. Come on. Pastor Craig Groeschel said this, the church does not exist for us. We are the church and we exist for the world. We're here to make an impact. We don't just go to church. We are the church. So we have to change our mindset. You're not a church attender. You're not just a church person that just goes to church. You are a participator. You are the church. If, if you have received Christ as your Lord, he's brought you into the church and he's sending you out to make a difference. Come on. So we need to ask this question and I, I don't want you to answer it out loud, but internally, and as you go this week and take this message and begin to apply it in your life, um, I want you to ask this question, am I a consumer or am I a contributor? And then I want you to break that out into categories. Where am I a consumer and where am I a contributor? Because we've been very much shaped by a consumer culture, but the kingdom culture is not one of consumption, but one of contribution. And I'll tell you why this is actually more beneficial for us to become contributors rather than to remain in the level of a consumer. In John chapter four, we have this incredible story about Jesus talking to this woman at a well. He gives this incredible lesson to her. He talks about being the living water and all this stuff. And it says, meanwhile, in John chapter four, verse 31, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. Now that's where I would be like, amen. This is the word of the Lord. Pastor Jake, eat something. You're right, I'm famished. But this is where Jesus goes a different direction in verse 32. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. They're like, Chick-fil-A? No, no, that's not what he means. Verse 33, they're like, did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, 
My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. And what Jesus is saying here is I am nourished. I am fulfilled. I am motivated by something other than just the, the consumption and the, and the filling of my natural needs. There's a higher level of fulfillment and purpose that drives me forward to do what I'm supposed to do, that I get nourished. I get filled. I get satisfied when I lock into who God's called me to be and do what he's called me to do. Come on. You see, you can't eat enough chicken sandwiches or in and out burgers to, to feel and to be fulfilled the way that you will be when you're in the will of God, moving forward in the destiny of God that he's made for you. Come on. I want you to understand that you were made on purpose and for a purpose. There is a, a destiny that is shaped like you and you're meant to step into it and to put it on just like Iron Man, Tony Stark puts his armor on and goes out and kicks some serious boute, as the French would say. Come on, you were designed, you were made on purpose and for a purpose. And when you lock into that, you are nourished and you are fulfilled. There's a level of fulfillment that only happens when you're in service. And this is a counterintuitive, countercultural, dare I say, supernatural principle that is hard for us to get a hold of, but it's locked into something as simple as serving and making this move from spiritual consumer to spiritual contributor. What are some of the traits of a spiritual consumer? A spiritual consumer comes to church and is an attender and takes in a message and then tries to derive value from that message in an isolated state, okay? In the same way, when I go to Burger King and I want to have it my way, I order the Whopper, I don't want them to like follow me home. I'm like, you stay in there, BK person. You're beautiful. I love you. You're awesome. But I'm taking my Whopper and I'm leaving, and I exchanged my value. I gave you my money. I gave you my time, but I'm out of here. And now I'm going to where I go. You stay where you are and we have the separation. But that's not what a contributor does. A contributor doesn't just leave, doesn't take something of value and go and consume it in isolation. A contributor says, I receive value and I share value with the world around me. Come on. So I, I pray and I hope that today you're receiving value. And I know that you are. You're being trained and taught. And, and I, I'm, I'm opening the scriptures, right? I'm serving in my gift package to open the scriptures to you and offer you some teaching and some training. It's like the bread, right, that God's giving us of his word. And we're, we're learning and we're growing and we're taking it in. But a mistake would be to say, oh, I'm going to take that message and I'm just going to go back to my life. And I'm going to be isolated from my fellow brothers and sisters in the church and isolated from the world. And I'll consume this in private for my own spiritual nourishment. That is, that is not the mentality of a disciple of Jesus. The disciple of Jesus says, man, I was fed and now I'm going to feed. Come on. I was fed, but now I'm going to feed. I was nourished and now I'm going to nourish. I was watered. Somebody gave me water to drink and now I'm going to give someone else water to drink. So we make that move from spiritual consumer to spiritual contributor. And here's what's awesome about this is that when you make this move, what you will find is that the, the food is better and the water is sweeter and everything is better when you're letting it be fresh and flow through you. When you trust God to say, he's filling me, he's feeding me, but as I serve other people, it gets even better and better. And this is where we can agree with Jesus and say, man, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God. I am wearing the destiny that God has created for me to wear. Number three, how do we live a life that leaves an impact when it comes to service? Number three, we need to identify our contribution. You need to identify your contribution. In Romans chapter 12, verse 6, we read this verse recently in church. It talks about God and his grace giving us different gifts for doing certain things well. Uh, it says here, uh, if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak it out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, then give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Here's the thing. You're not me. Thank God. I'm not you. Also, thank God. You are you. I am I. Am I. I am me. How do we say this correctly? And God has given each of us a different gift. And it's important that for, for each and every one of us that we, we find out who we are in God and we, let, we identify that contribution and say, this is the way that I'm going to serve my church this is the way that I'm going to serve the world. Are you with me? And we provide an atmosphere, an environment for this. Because our big thing is we want everybody to take the next step with Jesus. And so that's why we do Next Track every single Sunday, except for the fifth Sunday of the month. Every single week, you can go to theater, uh, is it theater two, at 9 a.m., 
during the first service that we have here. Is that when it is? 9 a.m.? Yeah. At 9 a.m. And you can learn to figure, you can get trained. Okay, here's my gift. This is how I can discover my gift and start that journey and that process. And here's how I can actually implement it and put it into play in the church, right? Serving in the church is not just finding the greatest need and going there, although that's a really good thing to do, but it's actually bought, it's actually uh, ultimately about you figuring out what God has actually gifted you to do and then being in that place. And when you find that place, it's just really fun and exciting to make a difference because you're, you're in what God has called you to be in. So you, we need to identify our contribution. So my challenge to you is if you haven't gone through Next Track, then go. Uh, take the spiritual gifts test, like find out who you are in God, start that journey so that you can make a difference in your church and make a difference in the world. Number four, and we're going to finish up with this today, that our call, how we live a life that leaves an impact in serving others is that we serve in the church and also as the church in the world. See, it's, it's very important. We, we kind of have this thing happening right now in our culture and in our society where people are like creatively inventing how they serve God. And it fits very well with our consumer-oriented, individualistic Western uh, society, which is that we've sort of said, well, you know, yeah, I, I kind of understand, um, like, you know, I, I would serve in the nursery at church, but that's not really my thing. Like, I would serve uh, as an usher or greeter, but that uh, doesn't really seem that important to me. And so I'm not really going to serve in the church. I'm just going to volunteer, like, around the community, and that will be my service. Well, there's nothing wrong with volunteering around the community, but you're missing something important, which is if you're part of the family, you need to be part of the family uh, chores, part of the family work, part of the family uh, action. Come on. That'd be like Evie and Jack. I want you to imagine, take, take this scenario. I sit down at the dinner table. I've got three kids. Bethany and I are there. Bethany's made something amazing, like the peach bacon chicken that she made last night, which was unbelievable, you guys. I'm just telling you. I didn't even care the duck sauce because I had that food. It was incredible. So we're sitting down, down to this uh, amazing meal. Here's Evie. Here's Jack. Here's Penny. They say, Dad, we've been talking. We've been thinking about it. We've decided we're not going to do chores. We are going to go help the other kids across the street do their chores because we feel like that fits what we want to do. Also, it always happens so that when we dictate our own volunteerism that it's usually quite a bit less and, and, and more fun and more specific to what we want to do rather than actually serving um, so we're going to go do that instead of chores. Yeah. No. Let me think about this again. No. You live here. You consume here. Come on. The, the, the house that you're in, the place that somebody has provided for you, where you are nourished is also where you should be nourishing. Come on. Where you are provided for is also where you should provide for. Come on, people. So we get these principles. Come on. If you're a parent, you recognize this. No, you got to do chores. Now, I'm not saying all the stuff we do in church is exactly like chores. It's not. In fact, it's highly fulfilling. It's quite a bit different. But at a very basic level, where you are consuming, where you are part of the family, we need to also be connected in helping the mission and the vision be accomplished. Come on. So we serve in our church. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Encourage each other, build each other up, just as you are already doing. Everyone has a job in this family, right? So we, when we get here and when we're thinking about our church, we're not just coming as consumers, but we're coming as contributors saying, how can I help make what we are and what we're doing uh, come to pass and actually go forward? So this is something that's really powerful uh, to serve in the church. But then when we connect with this, when we as a family have our act together and we're serving and, and, and there's enough workers in the nursery and there's enough people to make the service happen and everything is filled, guess what we become? We become powerful and able to really serve out in the world as the city on the hill that we were called to be. And so when we serve in the church, what we also do is unlock our capacity that we can serve as the church in the world. But there's something powerful about unity and everybody locking arms and saying, I'll do my part, small as it may be, so that we can do the great things God's called us to do. We can do the great things. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. We are the light of the world together as a church. I love the fact that our new building that we bought, Skate World, we put a big 40 foot banner on the thing. So if you drive by, 
right? You can see it from everywhere. It says, future home of Joy Church. You know, it's cool. And, uh, and you know why it's cool? Because we want it to be impossible to miss the fact that Jesus loves you in this city. We want it to be absolutely unmistakable that God has a presence and he's here building his kingdom in this community. Come on. And that sign is just one very, very small part because what, what the sign is just indicating, hey, something cool is coming uh, to this location here in the near future. But what's more important is when we fill that building with our presence, with the life of God. Come on, when God shows up through our serving and our loving and we take it to another level, it's awesome, guys. But that's what our church is called to be, that, that city on a hill shining the light of Jesus out in our community. And so God gets glory. God gets his way. He gets to be glorified when we operate as the church in the world. So it's two, two things here. It's we serve in the church. Come on, we're part of the family. And then as we lock into that, we become, uh, we're serving as the church out in the world. And it's really powerful. And what we do as individuals in the small acts of service, like showing up and loving kids and watching kids in the nursery, that contributes to what we do together as the church in the world. So conclusion, when we choose to live differently, we will begin to truly make a difference. We will be living lives that leave an impact, that make an impact, and we will see the world around us change. People's lives will be changed when you use your gifts to serve like Jesus served you, come on, that we really become the church when we choose to live this life of service, not doing things in the ordinary way, but doing things in an extraordinary way. And it doesn't look like this big spiritual thing. It doesn't maybe look like this big deal. And maybe you think, oh, my contribution's so small and how I serve, but it all comes together to be the beautiful picture of what God wants to see come together. So let's leave an impact. Let's live a life that leaves an impact and be people that serve. Amen. Today, as every week happens, there are people that come to church looking for hope, looking for life, looking for answers. And maybe that's you today. And, and maybe you know, hey, I need Jesus. Maybe you don't. Maybe that's like foreign to you. Maybe everything I've been talking about is like, man, that's cool. I want to be part. I want to be part of this family. I want to be, I want to serve like Jesus served me. But you know, the very first Thing we can ever do, the very first step of faith, the very first res- is just to respond to what Jesus did for you. You see, before we ever serve Jesus, before we ever do anything good for him, we have to receive this really, really good thing he did for us. And that's the, the core of the Christian faith that Jesus left the right hand of the Father. He came down to our mess and he gave his life for you and for me. And so this, the very first thing we do is to say, Jesus, I just want you. I just want you. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I'm going to follow you the rest of my life that we receive what Jesus did for us. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes. If that's you today and you're like, Pastor Jake, I want this reality of God in my life. I want to know Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I know I'm not perfect. I know I've made mistakes, but I want to receive his grace and forgiveness today. And I want to become his his follower. I want to become a child of God. If that's you today, you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus for real. Not just some religious thing, but authentically, actually, tangibly. If you want to do that, would you raise your hand so I can see? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to follow Jesus for real. I want it to be real. I'm not just looking for religion. I'm not just looking for church. I'm not just looking for just something else in my life. I want Jesus and I want to follow him. Anybody else in this place? I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Come on, let's pray this prayer together. If you, if you lift your hand and for all of us, let's just pray this prayer with sincerity. Dear Jesus, I confess my sin to you. I know that I have not lived up to your standard, but I thank you for your grace and mercy revealed to me at the cross where you gave your life for me and made a way for me to be reconciled with you. I give you my life every single part. And I choose to follow you today. In Jesus' name, amen.